Looking for something for the national park lover in your life? Maybe that national park lover is you. Then be sure to check out The Gaze Shop, the official home of all Gaze at the National Parks merchandise, featuring original designs inspired by the sights, monuments, and majesty of the national parks. New this month is an exciting handmade item, the Gray Wolf Tote. This hand-printed canvas tote bag honors the beauty and majesty of the Gray Wolf. The range of the Gray Wolf once covered most of North America, but they were ruthlessly hunted and displaced from their traditional habitat. Today, through conservation efforts, the gray wolf has made a successful comeback, marking not only a return for the species, but a helpful aid in the health and diversity of many ecosystems. Act now because this is a limited hand-printed run of totes that won't last long. And a portion of all sales of the gray wolf tote go to the American Gray Wolf Foundation, which supports education about and the conservation of the gray wolf. Also, don't forget about our print and sticker collections, too. Visit shop.gazeatthenationalparks.com to bring some of the national parks home with you. Thinking like a watershed is really thinking in ecologies and Mm -hmm. how we're connected. So if you start with cultivating and nurturing and fostering the community connections very locally, that will move out through the watershed. At least that's our uh, sort of guiding principle in so much of our direct uh, community engagement work and stewardship work. So I think you're exactly right. I mean, we're still so very grassroots, though. Yes, we do have our sights on uh, influencing or involving uh, some of the decision makers who are really significant polluters and doing significant damage to our landscape with point source or other types of development that that aggravates uh, the health of, of our landscape. However, we're very much focused on learning the processes locally and part Part of that learning process of landscape health and learning about the environment is also learning about how we're connected to one another and how we can build community to make change. Hello, and welcome to Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And this is the part where you'd usually hear Mike's voice saying, and I'm Mike, but Mike is not here in the studio today because he is at home being visited by three ghosts. And we sincerely hope that it's working because y'all know how dark-sided that girl can be. But to be accurate, as a way to expand the show and include more voices, we're also producing Trail Mix episodes independently. Don't worry, we're always going to be here together for our main trail episodes, but it's kind of fun to produce Trail Mix episodes together and also independently. So here's one from me today. In our experience with the trails in New River Gorge and researching the science connected to rivers, Mike and I had been asking each other the question, how can we engage with rivers in a meaningful way? And what does that even look like? Luckily, I didn't have to go too far to get some real insight into this. In fact, all I had to do was go downstairs and knock on my neighbor Heather's door. Heather Fennick is the founder and director of the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership, a nonprofit in the New Brunswick, New Jersey area connected to the Raritan River, whose mission involves creating community through meaningful river engagement, including restoring, enhancing, and conserving the natural resources of this area through stewardship, education, and innovation. I recently got to sit down with Heather and chat with her all about watersheds, the story of water pathways, and how river stewardship can be something that we not only do when we're outside in natural spaces, but can also be a part of our daily practice. Heather. Good morning, Dusty. Good morning. Okay, so it is Friday morning after Thanksgiving. Yeah. And um, I'm so grateful that you were like down to, to chat today. Well, and I'm grateful for you for giving some attention to our landscape, uh, river ecology, rivers, you know, so thankful. About. Yeah, so we are currently doing a whole bunch of episodes about trails in New River Gorge. New River Gorge started as a national river. And so we've been sort of like investigating rivers, river ecology, and 
and how to engage with rivers. And when we came to this, I thought Heather Fennick is the perfect person to talk to about engaging with rivers because you have sort of made a career for yourself in doing that. And you have definitely created community around doing that through a nonprofit that you created. For me, that's exactly it regarding rivers is that they tell a story of how we're connected. They tell a story of community. They inspire us to build community. At least that's been the case for me. And tracing their paths through the landscape, tracing the way they formed ecologically, and understanding how we as humans are connected to that is really just been such a powerful experience for me. It hasn't been the case that this was a a career design originally. It's happened naturally, organically, kind of the way rivers have shaped the landscape that we live on. I feel like I've learned a lot about rivers from you. I feel like we should also tell the people who are listening. We're friends, and we both live in the same building. Yeah. But I met you through other nonprofit work that I was doing here in the New Brunswick area. That is my favorite way to meet people. You will find the best people. In the nonprofit world. In the nonprofit world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so tell me a little bit about, so you are the founder and director of the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership. I did not know what a watershed was prior to meeting you. So could you share with us a little bit about what a watershed is and why watersheds are important to you? Sure, yeah. A watershed tells the story of how a river is made. For all of our waterways and for all parts of the landscape around the globe, everywhere is in a watershed defined by how the water flows across the land. A watershed is literally a story of the water cycle and how that interacts with the land and interacts with the high points on the land to direct water flow out to our major oceans and the big expanses of water on the land. A watershed has natural borders that are ridges or high points or mountains. And And the water often has shaped the land as it has moved through the landscape. You know, you were talking about New Gorge, you know, that's defined exactly by the Anytime water moves, there's erosion. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the natural contours of the landscape are often defined, you know, if if not by plate tectonics or by volcanic activity, they're often defined then by the flow of water across the land surface. But for watersheds, it's more a story of the forming of the river. It's also a story of how, in particularly the urbanized areas, you know, when you're talking about what a watershed is, it's a story of interactions. It's a story of ecological interactions, human interactions, soil hydrology, plant life, animal life, and then that water cycle piece. Um, Mm. But in a particular place that tells the story story of how the river came to be and how the river is functioning. I see. So the sound of the word watershed kind of sounds like, I mean, the first time I heard it, I thought like a mouth of a river, like a place where water is shed into somewhere else. But in fact, it's like the land that sort of surrounds a river where like when water falls as rain, it's like eventually that rain is going to get to that river over the land that is surrounding and connected to that river. Absolutely. Right. So it's precipitation rain or snow, and it's not just rivers, you know, Mm -hmm. streams, um, brooks, uh, creeks, they all can have their own mini watersheds and watersheds scale. Mm. So they they build into each other like like Russian nesting dolls, you know, so you can have small what are called headwater streams that are considered first order streams that build into when they merge with another stream, a second order stream. Mm. And when those merge with another stream, It's a combination of a couple of second order streams and it becomes a third order stream. Mm. And as these waterways build up, they generally get faster and then move into once you are at a higher order of combining streams, you end up with a river, you know, a Mm. proper river, a faster flowing waterway. What was your own relationship to 
engaging with rivers? And then how did that lead to engaging with the lower Raritan watershed? I've always been a bit of a water baby. In high school, I did about a month long, what's called a flat water canoe trip in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota and Canada. And that was really the beginning of a a love just with connecting with water and being on the water and understanding it more poetically necessarily than scientifically and just having a deep connection there. And through throughout my life as I've gone through school and had various jobs. I've always sought out opportunities for on-water experiences. But when I moved to New Jersey, there were a couple of striking things. First of all, I moved to New Brunswick, which is sadly very disconnected from its main water course, the Raritan River. It's disconnected by a highway um, Mm -hmm. that just bisects where folks live from this beautiful expanse, this beautiful natural resource that really should be everyone's right to experience, you know, just as a view shed looking We're out on it. We're talking about Route 18. Route 18, There's yeah. no beautiful way to like get over to the river without having to cross the highway. <laughs> None. No, no. no. There's no natural way. I mean, I walk over there most days and like it's, yeah, you you have to either get on on the sidewalk on a ramp or you have to like go to, you know, one of the places where, you know, you can exit off of Route 18 in order to get over to where the natural space is. So that wasn't always the case. Route 18 was part of a slum clearance measure in the 1950s. So it was, uh, of course, there was a need for improved circuitry, improved transportation infrastructure throughout New Jersey. I mean, we're an incredibly densely populated landscape. Yeah. Um, and you know, we needed good connections from New Brunswick to the Turnpike and to all these other major thoroughfares. However, there were strategic decisions made to put the roadway, Route 18, through densely populated area adjacent to the Raritan, where it was primarily low-income people of color mm. who lived in that area. About the same time, folks started thinking about, well, where are we going to put everyone who's being moved off this landscape? And you know, the public housing projects, they were called memorial homes, were built just about uh, two blocks away from here. So that was built, uh, yeah, going to have my dates wrong, but in the 50s-ish as a place to put the folks who were moved out. And those buildings were demolished in 2001. It was a tremendous failure in public housing strategy to consolidate mm. very poor folks in poorly designed um, buildings. Um, but anyway, going back to the idea of cutting off our communities from the river, Route 18 is strategically placed to move folks out of direct contact from the river, you know, which had in many cases been a livelihood for some people. But it also, perhaps in defense of some of the folks who were making the these decisions, it also moved folks away from some of the risks in a mm. floodplain, you know, in an mm-hmm. area that flooded a lot. So how did this circumstance with the community and the Raritan River play a role in the creation of the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership? So I landed in New Brunswick in 19. 19- 1998 and really wanted to sink my hands into the soil. I'd really wanted a place to settle down for a little while while I was working on my graduate degree. And first of all, you know, as I mentioned, one of the most salient things was you know, being cut off from the river, which was a tragedy. But another thing was the development of New Jersey has made it so that so much of our soils are contaminated with lead or mm. other pollutants. And connecting with the soil in an area where you have a lot of pollutants isn't the safest thing. There weren't too many community gardens. Actually, there were no community gardens when I moved here, and I wanted to put plants in the soil. My first involvement in thinking about watersheds really came from starting community gardens and building up a handful of community gardens throughout New Brunswick. After we had maybe a dozen or so gardens in place, just a collective of students and community members had started these raised bed gardens 
and started coming together to talk about food security issues in a town that had a really miserable excuse for a grocery store. We found that food security didn't relate just to fresh produce, but also related to where folks were getting their protein source. Mm. And a number of people were fishing for consumption in the Raritan River. That caused a lot of folks to sort of step back and say, well, uh, how safe is the water in a very industrialized area where the land is polluted by leads and other contaminants? How safe is the water as a supportive life system for the fish? And how safe are those fish for the people who are catching them to consume? Mm. Um, And so the work that I now do in terms of water quality monitoring really started with just the question of how safe are the fish to consume. Wow. I didn't know that at all. What a fascinating journey and what a fascinating problem. Nonprofits exist to solve some kind of problem or some kind of gap in community, in justice, in life, and somehow there's some gap in the nonprofits trying to solve that problem or trying to bridge that gap. So the problem was that food insecurity, people fishing in the Raritan in order to find a protein source. Wow, I had no idea about that. Right. It's connected to, though, when you're talking about community gardening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's part of the watershed. Yeah. Yes, and, it is, you yeah. know, so food security, human health, landscape health, that's all part of the genesis, the origin of thinking around starting a nonprofit for, um, to address environmental health. But then also, um, you know, so for a few years, we were doing the community gardening, we were starting to get our heads around what it would take to have a meaningful water quality monitoring program. And during this time, I had a young child in my life, my daughter, Mm -hmm. um, who would go out with me to the Raritan River, we'd go out for walks along the canal, we'd walk along the Raritan, she would notice the trash. I mean, she noticed all the beautiful landscape as well, and all of the critters, but she also noticed the trash. And for her fourth birthday, she said that she wanted to have a birthday party to clean up the trash. Love that. Um, Love that. So we did a little cleanup and realized that in addition to a lot of interest in the water quality monitoring work that we were starting to do, that there was also a lot of interest in cleaning up this landscape. And Mm. to support that in a meaningful way, you know, those exercises going forward, it just became clear that a nonprofit was a really good conduit to maintain some of that activity. I love when nonprofits just sort of emerge because it kind of has to. Right. And what was shocking for me as someone who was working at Rutgers University, someone who was doing a lot of community engagement through my work and my studies at Rutgers, was that an institution like Rutgers had not initiated this type of activity in the oh. decades that it had sat along the banks of the old Raritan, as the wow. uh, alma mater goes. <laughs> goes um, yeah. And it was it was really shocking. So part of the initial activity was looking to see if anyone had done anything like this from Rutgers. Entity had done this type of stewardship, doing sort of an assessment of who might be a good partner. And in asking those questions, it sort of naturally built partnerships. People kept saying, well, no, we really should, shouldn't we? Mm-hmm. Um, along that path, started building the connections to bring to bear in creating an organization that had strong support from Rutgers, from other entities in the area. But the fact of the matter was that Rutgers did not have some sort of a stewardship program around the Raritan before that in any meaningful way. Fascinating. Stewardship is a word that I see a lot. And it's a word that I mean, I you know, we take very seriously because we feel like anytime, anytime anyone enters a natural space, particularly a national park space, like you are a de facto steward in that moment from the way you engage on a trail, the way what you bring, what you take out with you, which you should take out everything, obviously, the way you follow the leave no trace principles, the way you give animals space, all of it is stewardship. I'm curious about your thoughts on stewardship education 
For the lower Raritan Watershed Partnership, stewardship absolutely has an element of the leave no trace. However, you know, that's really a narrative that you know, is more meaningful in a national park setting. Sure. You know, so in an urbanized landscape like uh, central New Jersey, what we advance around the stewardship narrative is how can we restore really degraded lands? Mm, um, mm-hmm. And so stewardship is definitely cleaning up after ourselves, but sadly, it's also cleaning up after everyone who everyone came before else. us mm-hmm. who made such a big mess of our waterways. You know, we do regular stream cleanups of our soils. We advocate for soil remediation and for brownfields and super funds clean up. Mm-hmm. And then also there's significant degradation just of the natural landscape. And so we are actively moving toward restoration of salt meadows, salt marsh. We're actively moving toward riparian area protections where in places where you have a lot of erosion, you know, erosion is a natural process. However, it is often exacerbated by development. It's exacerbated by the way we live on the land in ways that are so extreme stream that they cause a, a lot of problems uh, around you know flooding around in in some ways putting lives at risk where even in a stream in New Brunswick there's a house that's falling into Mile Run Brook so one of the pieces of stewardship we talk about is even just stream bank plantings or or riparian area protections where you Mm. are stabilizing the stream bank for erosion control. So to your question of stewardship, yes, I mean, there's the personal responsibility piece of it, but we feel like that is secondary when young people start getting involved with cleaning up other people's messes. There is a, a deeper understanding of personal responsibility around that because they are doing the job that others should have been doing for a long time Mm -hmm. and moving things forward for themselves in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, so stewardship for us is more about building community around affecting change, if Uh, that makes sense. Yes, yes. And it sounds like here we have sort of like the, when we are involved with something like a stream cleanup, that's sort of like the end of the line of the problem, right? Something has happened to cause all of these things to be in the water. Now we have to get them out. And I feel like the work that you do is also part of like building community around how can we bring the stewardship up the ladder a bit rather than just focusing here. Like we're going to do the work here at the bottom of the ladder, but also we got to, we got to affect change up at the top of the ladder too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thinking like a watershed is really thinking in ecologies and mm-hmm. how we're connected. Yeah. You know, so if you start with cultivating and nurturing and fostering the community connections very locally, yeah, you know, that will move out through the watershed. At least that's our uh, sort of guiding principle in so much of our direct uh, community engagement work um, and stewardship work. So I think you're exactly right. I mean, we're still so very grassroots, though. You know, yes, we do have our sights on uh, influencing or involving uh, some of the decision makers who are really significant polluters and doing significant damage to our landscape you know, with point source or other types of development uh, that aggravates uh, the health of, of our landscape. However, we're very much focused on learning the processes locally and the Part of that learning process of landscape health and learning about the environment is also learning about how we're connected to one another and how we can build community to make change. When it comes to hiring, you need to trust your gut. But what if you could give your gut some help? When you want to find top talent fast, you need Indeed. Did you know that during this minute that we talked to you about Indeed, 16 people will get hired to a new job, according to Indeed data worldwide? That's right. And the right candidate is doing everything they can to find you. And if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything you can to find them too. There's no need to spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you 
you can do it all with Indeed. And you can find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Indeed is here to do the hard work for you. Sponsor a job and boom! Instant Match is going to show you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your job description immediately after you post. And you can invite them to apply right away. With Instant Match, you can start hiring fast. And candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. Visit Indeed.com slash gaze to start hiring now. And that's gaze, G-A-Z-E. Again, that's Indeed.com slash gaze. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. What if planting a tree was as easy as making a purchase? Well, not only is it easy, but it's incredibly rewarding and helpful in the fight against climate change, something I know we're both concerned about. Introducing Aspiration Zero Credit Card, the credit card that helps the planet with every purchase you make. We are big fans of Aspiration Zero because Aspiration Zero is the first credit card that fights climate change by planting trees with every swipe. And who doesn't want that? The way it works is simple. With an Aspiration Zero credit card, you plant two trees with every purchase you make. And two trees soaks up about the same amount of carbon dioxide from the air as you put out every day. Make your dollars make a difference. Apply for the Aspiration Zero card today and earn a $300 welcome bonus after spending $3,000 in the first 90 days. Apply right now at Aspiration.com slash gaze to go carbon neutral effortlessly and to earn a $300 bonus. Go to Aspiration.com slash gaze. And that's G-A-Z-E. The Aspiration Zero MasterCard is issued by Beneficial State Bank pursuant to license by MasterCard International Incorporated. Good credit required. Terms and conditions apply. So what are some ways that you feel like everyone can engage with Rivers in a way that is meaningful? So even stopping to listen to the water flowing under a storm drain, under a grate um, on the street, on the sidewalk, Stopping to listen, removing the trash that's in the storm drain, sitting on top of the surface of the storm drain, putting that trash in a garbage can so that that trash doesn't end up in the waterway is a way that we can engage with the river. So many of our waterways are completely hidden or disappeared. One of our catchphrases is hashtag look for the river. And we're always encouraging folks to look for the river, not just with your eyes, but with your senses. Mm -hmm. And that includes you know, when you see a, a storm drain on the side of the road with a lot of trash in it, that you stop, you listen, and you make the connection that, oh my gosh, you know, the water that I hear under the storm drain is flowing to the river. Mm. You know, I'm looking for the river and I'm stewarding. You know, I'm acting yeah. as a good steward. I'm acting in stewardship for the waterway. And I have that connection with the waterway mm. through my actions. Even, you know, very much upstream in an area where there are a few trees and you have no idea there is a visual cue uh, for a waterway anywhere around. That's so interesting that the way you describe the storm drain flowing to the river, because that is the reality in an urban setting. That's the tributary headed to the river, if you will. Whereas up on a mountain, there might be a small stream that's eventually headed to the river. But in an urban area, the water flowing down the street, the water flowing underneath the storm drain, those are the water pathways headed to the river. Absolutely. So when I was a kid, I used to love following the water that was running into the street, you know, from a sprinkler or from someone with a hose, you know, watering their lawn. And I would see the water flowing in the gutter and like, oh, well, this is interesting. You know, it, there's movement, there's activity of that. And I, I grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis, you know, without a easily identifiable waterway in several block radius from my house. But just following the path of water flows when it rains on our urban New Brunswick streets is eye-opening. You know, you watch the water flow. There's a beauty in it, even when it's picking up the oils that have come from our vehicles, you know, you have mm -hmm. that beautiful iridescent sheen. And then you watch that flow into our storm drains and you think, oh, well, it's a beautiful iridescent sheen, but boy, that doesn't belong 
in our storm drains. In our storm drains or in our rivers. Or in our rivers or in our bellies because, you know, it, the, our Raritan is a drinking water source, mm-hmm. not just for us, but also for so many critters mm-hmm. in our environment. So in terms of connecting with rivers, yeah, yes, I mean, it's an absolute gift to be able to go out and do what's called stream walking. You know, mm-hmm. You're just out in a stream uh, or in a river you're yeah. wearing waders and you can be in the water up to your chest and you just feel the pressure of the water rushing past you and the world disappears except for that moment Mm. in the waterway and it's just beautiful. However, it's also equally as beautiful in some ways in my view to trace the landscape and figure out where those hidden waters are that we've buried through development over the years by putting these waters in culverts or pipes and Mm. by figuring out there are pressure points in the landscape that we can change. You know, where can we enhance through plantings, through cleanups, the natural landscape so that it does a better job of holding the water in place before it runs into the river to pollute it? How can the land do the job of filtering the pollutants out before the water flows into the river or our streams? And I find that very beautiful in its own way because you're connecting directly even with a super urbanized landscape. You've mentioned how the lower rare Raritan Watershed Partnership does stream monitoring. Can you tell us a little bit about what stream monitoring is and how, is that something that anyone can do? Yeah, absolutely. So the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership, we also just refer to ourselves as LRWP, we have a couple of different types of water quality monitoring that we recruit civic science volunteers to engage with and to help us out with. So we're always looking for volunteers to help us adopt streams. These are the feeder streams that feed into the Raritan. We do what are called habitat assessments a couple of times a year of mm-hmm. about 35 different waterways that feed into the lower main stem of the Raritan. Folks who adopt these streams are stream keepers. We call them our stream keepers. Mm-hmm. And they are the eyes and the ears of impact to the waterway. They're looking for trash, erosion, impacts of climate change. They go out with a clipboard and a form to basically take the pulse of the river with a series of questions. They will measure the temperature of the water. They will measure the velocity, you know, how quickly the water is moving, you know, what the water flow is, evaluate the types of plants in the area. And they're doing that with an eye to understand Understanding the base of the food chain. They want to know how healthy that stream is for the critters, the macroinvertebrates that live or should live in the muck of the stream bed, mm. um, under rocks or in the sandy soils or in the mud. We evaluate the health with a very simple checklist that anyone really 15 or older could use. And they report back their findings twice a year for us. And we have a database of information information on all of these 35 streams in the waterway. And we have trainings every spring and every fall for Mm. that program. Then we have one other program, which is our pathogens monitoring program. Mm -hmm. That is on every Thursday, we are going out into the Raritan River and catching water samples of river water and having those samples analyzed in a lab for the presence of disease-causing bacteria for pathogens, basically. Mm. We're looking for something called enterococcus, and then we're looking for the presence of fecal matter. Mm. Yeah, because fecal matter is often a trigger for disease causing pathogens. Absolutely. And that is also a volunteer run program. Yeah, we're a 100% volunteer run organization, and we would not exist without the warm bodies who care about the waterway. We have trainings also for the pathogens monitoring program, uh, and that usually takes place in April or May of every year. And that that pathogens monitoring program runs throughout the summer. Every Thursday, we require that folks commit to monitoring um, the river with us at least five days throughout the summer. And that's an entire Thursday is dedicated every week. uh, An entire Thursday is dedicated to water quality monitoring. Take a peek at our website for trainings um, and how to get involved. It's lowerraritanwatershed.com. 
org. I'm so curious about the data. So again, we have these two different programs. We yeah. have the visual habitat assessments of the streams. And from the gifts of volunteering that our volunteers have provided and the storytelling they've done around our streams, we've really gotten a handle on which streams have the most pollution in them, which mm. ones have the most trash. And we've been able to prioritize everything from cleanups to the stream bank plantings to do erosion control. And we've gotten a little bit of a sense for which streams are under perhaps most pressure for, due to climate change and which streams might eventually overbank and cause flooding. Mm. You know, so we've learned a lot about potential risk, human risk in particular, through the work of these volunteers in our in our streams through the visual habitat assessments. Um, so that's sort of um, colloquial data. That's storytelling around, mm. around that piece of things. And then with our pathogens work, what we have learned... Um, is not so surprising. You know, we have known for a long time that pathogens are bad, you know, and right, you right. Know, so, <laughs> so we don't want to see them in our water and that when we have high hits, that's usually associated with high precipitation events because what's happening is with rain washing the surfaces of the land, flushing everything off into the storm drains, we will always see higher bacterial and pathogens numbers. Yeah, so we have chosen the locations for our pathogens monitoring based on where no public health monitoring exists for non-bathing public access sites. Mm -hmm. So we go to six sites along the lower main stem of the Raritan where there is what's called primary contact with the waterway, which means that people are either canoeing, kayaking, jet skiing, in some cases, swimming full body immersion in the waterway. However, being that these are non-bathing public access sites, the County Department of Health isn't doing any monitoring. The State Department of Health isn't doing any monitoring. And no one is communicating potential risk to the larger community. Oh, so because they're not public bathing sites, then nobody's going in there. If they were public, then you would assume that people were going into the river. But these are considered non-public. However, at each one of our sites, we have abundant documentation of this primary contact with the waterway. Yeah. And these are locations where often the people who do have the primary contact with the waterway, in some cases fishing, as I said, you know, swimming, mm -hmm. they are often you know, lower income community areas where people cannot easily access the shore points. They can't mm. go down to those bathing sites. But during the hot summer months, they want to fish, they want to cool off, they want to swim, they want to have that direct contact, that beautiful experience of connecting with the waterway. Right. And this is their local most waterway to connect with. Anyway, so we are collecting data about these sites and reporting out every week. And the most interesting thing for us is basically a validation what our concerns were around precipitation are true. You know, mm -hmm. um, when it rains a lot, you are going to have grosser waters and more problematic uh, around health risk. Mm -hmm. But we have also started a program, and we're now working with the Environmental Protection Agency and with folks at Rutgers to evaluate where the contamination is coming from in terms of animal source. So is this human feces? Is it bird? Are we dealing with maybe some agricultural issues from way upstream? Where are these sources coming from, mm -hmm. once we know that source, then we can start addressing that more directly. You know, is mm -hmm. this sanitary sewage infrastructure that's malfunctioning? Mm -hmm. Do we need to drill down to find out where this is broken? Do we need to put more controls on birds Yeah, in certain places? Not like we're going to control birds, but, <laughs> but right. is, and is that as much of a risk as the human fecal impact, which I know mm. sounds gross, but this is what we have but to deal listen, with. listen, yeah. I mean, that's one of the, one of the seven and major leave no trace principles is all about human fecal matter. And also, you know, if you have pets or something like that, obviously their fecal matter doesn't need to be like, please walk over 100 feet away from any water source and bury it. Because if it gets into the water source, what a problem it causes. Same for like, you know, when campers are like, oh, I need to take a shower. So I'm just gonna like, go jump in and bring all these products with me that also are not helpful at all. The other thing is, and this is huge, if you spray your clothes with permethrin, or permethrin, however it's pronounced, and then you go and wash your clothes in a water source, like, it will kill 
everything around that. That permethrin is very strong. So like I have worn that before when going to, you know, when walking through a trail, but like I would never wash the clothes in a river. I just generally am like, no, it's probably not a good idea. But also like, it's also a good idea to remember, okay, I am, even if I put it in the washing machine, that permethrin in the water is going to get out somehow and it's going to head out somewhere. So to have some like insight, look for the river, right? To know where, you know, that water is headed. It's convenient to think that the actions that we take in our homes don't affect the nature outside, but they do entirely all the time. They absolutely do. And, you know, it's not just the permethrins that we're washing off our clothes in the laundry uh, in our homes that ends up in our waterways, but also all the microfibers from our clothes. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I'm so glad that you brought it back to the stewardship conversation because that individual stewardship you know, extends to so many aspects of our lives, making the choices of what we're putting in our bodies, what we're putting in our bodies you know, is our own you know, stewardship, but also how does disposal of that in the long run affect our natural environment? You know, the microfibers story. We have just tons of documentation now of microfibers being a significant part of our waterways. Um, you know, um, up there's, we're finding them inside of fish too, right? Right. Oh, and Ooh. all aquatic uh, creatures are affected by microfibers now. Um, the permethrin story, which is um, used as an insecticide. So so basically, you're putting it on yourself as a bug repellent, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, you know, not just the permethrin, but also you know any of the other uh, bug sprays that you might use. Yeah, you know, those are not just designed to keep you safe, but they're often designed to kill the critters that you're trying to ward off from biting your your ankles. You know, right, so, right. Um, and then the other stewardship stories you, know, you you talked about making sure that you're digging a hole for you know to use the bathroom, you know, far away from a water source. You want to make sure that you're carrying out you know, dog waste. It's something that I've seen a lot in our urban areas. People will have their dogs squat over a storm drain. And I see that. And it just, it, we have on our storm drains, it drains to river stamped on almost all of them. Yeah. You know, mm, so mm-hmm. um, communicating how, how, how Is that can part we... of your work that that happened? So that was actually with Federal Clean Water Act initiatives starting in the 1970s. Okay, and I okay. am a 1970s baby, but I can't claim involvement, you know, that early on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we absolutely do bring attention to the drains yeah. to river story. And we encourage all of our municipalities to include a medallion or a stamp drains to river on any changes to their storm mm-hmm. drains. And we also do storm drain painting, you know, so that's mm. uh, an act of storm stewardship, you know, a fun, creative act of stewardship. Bring attention in an artistic way. Absolutely. Right. I love that you continue to use the word story because it is. The storm drain story is fascinating. As in, yes, it drains to the river. Yes, anything I put in the storm drain now is going out to that river. I'm a participant in this story now. And I love the word story as the language there because it it makes us characters. It gives us responsibility in that moment. Right. And a story also can be a living object. Mm, you know, mm. um, you know, it can be co-produced. You know, mm. what is the ending of the story that we want to see? It is empowering to the folks who are taking initiative to get involved. It's It should be empowering to all of us uh, using the word story. So I, I, I like the way you framed that um, very much. I, I think that we all are characters. Characters and thinking on that, if we reflect on that seriously, you know, will perhaps change some of our behaviors for the better to come out with a, a better final ending. One of the things that I love and one of the things I continue to go back to, obviously climate change can feel like a giant, huge problem that is just has spun out of control in a way that we could never fix, we can never get back. I feel like we have two choices here, right? We can either get debilitated by the problem or we can fall in love with the solutions. That's just so beautifully put because 
on a day-to-day basis, you know, every new person I meet who gets engaged with this work, you know, I fall in love with in a way too. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're all following falling in love with the possibilities around climate change. Too, um, it, the word for me is responsibility, mm. but as in the ability to respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, which is less burdensome somehow than the word responsibility by itself. I agree. If you think you know, your response language. ability, we all have the ability to respond in some way to what we see around us, what we hear about what's happening around us. And you know, sure, it can be depressing at times. However, we all have the choice to shift from that depression to I'm going to take action now. I have the ability to respond to this in a positive way. And you know, that's what's so heartening about coming together as community and falling in love with the solutions and falling in love with the people who are you know, bringing about the solutions is mm-hmm. that you know, we have the ability to respond through community to make these changes as well. And um, it's, it's just been a great gift to do that. Okay, so remind us, where can we find LRWP? So the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership has a web presence. Mm-hmm. So we have um, our URL for our website is lowerraritanwatershed.org. We are on Instagram. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel with great videos about the watershed, about our rivers, about our streams. On almost all of our platforms, there's information about how to get involved. And we'd love to get involved with more folks. Yeah. So we invite all of you to get involved and um, to look for the river. Look for the river. Thanks, Dusty. Thank you, Heather. This has been Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. And we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. No lie, it's a little weird to do this outro without Mike. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at gaze at the national parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the national parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, gaze at the national parks.com. That's gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram and on our website and in the gaze shop is by Michael Ryan. All original music was written and performed by Dave Seaman and Mariella Klinger with Sean Sklios on the guitar. Our music producer, producer is Skylar Fortgang. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode, we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Middlesex County, New Jersey.